I would go with the flow of life, but it was chaotic and there was no intention or consciousness whatsoever. It was just like, you know, oh, all right, I'm going to a bar now. We'll see if I make it to work tomorrow. You know, and then of course things happen, negative consequences and trade-offs start to rear their heads and I wasn't prepared to deal with it. But at least now I can go with the flow of life. I forgive myself in advance for not doing everything that I put on that whiteboard. But it's like I'm gently setting the stage for the things that I'm going to gravitate towards because we do feel what we focus on and we are what we think. When it comes to people that are still struggling with alcohol or drugs or behavior addictions, transforming myself back into what that felt like for me, there was not much unconscious guilt or shame because that shit was all totally conscious. Lots of guilt and shame. I should be able to drink responsibly or I should be able to not use these hard drugs at least. I should be able to do this. Why can't I? I'm different. I'm not worthy. I'm unlovable. And th these thoughts weren't like swimming through my head. It was more of like this essence, these feelings. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies, hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. Welcome everyone to episode 217 of the show. My name is Matt Finch and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Scott. Feels like literally a couple of weeks, at least since we've last done a session together. And we only have about 40 minutes before your coaching call comes up. Uh, so rather than just kind of see where it goes. We were in synchronicity today. Again, we're always in synchronicity. You were talking about something and it's literally something that I've wanted to talk about since last night when I listened to it. I'm listening to this new Audible. Well, it's not new. It's new to me. It's called Letting Go by Sir David Hawkins, MD, PhD, who I think passed away several years ago. He's got a bunch of books, a bunch of great YouTube videos. And the part of this audiobook that I was listening to last night was talking about unconscious guilt. And a lot of the things in this book are about how we deal with emotions, suppression, repression, expression, projection. A lot of the things he was talking about were mirroring John, Dr. John Sarno stuff on tension myositis syndrome. But he was talking about this guilt, and I thought I had got rid of it, right? I really thought I had got totally rid of it. And then when he was talking about the section in the book, I was like, no way, not even close. Here's how he describes this guilt. Um, when, we, when, we're, when we're feeling, and we might not even realize that it's guilt, but when we're feeling in the moment, I should be doing something else. Here's an example for me recently. I was fighting off. I don't know what if it was a virus or what, but over the weekend I was fighting off getting sick. I felt like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm getting sick. And I was feeling guilty. Uh, and, and it wasn't even like a conscious notice, like, oh, I feel guilty. But I was feeling, ah, oh, I shouldn't be sick. You know, I take care of myself. And then I was like, well, I need to take some time off this weekend. You know, Willow had a bunch of camp performances for her uh, art camp and drama camp stuff. And my cousin, passed away at the age of 34, uh, I think two weeks ago now. So there's been a lot of stuff going on. And normally I work through the weekends. And here I was like just really, really low energy, low mood, uh, trying to fight myself to not actually do work. So I was feeling guilty. I didn't know it at the time, but I was like, I should be doing this. I should. And I just couldn't freaking like just relax and just be like, okay, this whole weekend, I'll just get the bare minimum of stuff done for work and then just not think about it again, right? Not think about it and then just really rest. I kept finding myself looking at the laptop and looking at my phone and, and thinking about what I need to do for work and all this. And, and I realize I still do that stuff quite a bit. It's, it's really tied to, I guess, my health and, and work stuff. But isn't that crazy? That's John Sarno would call it. The tyranny of the shoulds, really what it is, is it's a uh, hypertrophied or hypertrophied superego. And we've talked about that on our uh, episode a few months ago, how to use your superego to help you overcome addiction. And But then there's a part where you, if it's a hypertrophied, way too strong superego, it tells you you should be doing this. Well, you need to be doing this. 
And I realize I still have that going on uh, to, a, to a certain degree, nowhere near as, as it was in the past. And then he was saying a lot of things on how these unconscious emotions lead to all sorts of physical and psychological symptoms, basically. Yeah, well, that's a really good intro. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. We definitely have a sort of synchronicity. Every time we get on these calls before the podcast even starts, you'll say something or I'll say something and it's just already been reflected. Somehow there's some collective consciousness. And I feel like we have an additional synchronicity with our listeners sometimes. So hopefully I can only speculate, but it seems to be from the feedback that we get that we, we talk about some timely topics for things or for people who are struggling uh, or starting to see signs of hope. But I agree. I, I think, you know, I was talking with a friend last night who, and I don't remember how this even came up, just a casual conversation. We were talking about our work styles. And he's definitely, after however many years in investment banking, he worked in you know, restructuring and basically companies were going bankrupt all the time. And they had to figure out how to structure that and fire people and redo their assets and whole balance sheets and all that. And um, so after years of doing that, he just got into the habit of grinding. And now he runs a small business, which is expanding. But his preferred mode of being is to be grinding or else he, and he didn't say this, so maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but I would think if he's not grinding, he feels like there's something amiss or there's something wrong. So it's hard for him to relax. Now he's gotten a lot better at relaxing. He's super fit, he's super healthy, but he still has that, as far as work is concerned, a bit of beating himself up. Now, I know there are some studies that show that some level of stress is actually good for us. And stress uh, would, you know, we know about hormesis. We know that things that are uh, that activate certain processes in the body, like, you know, increase adrenaline or even cause a little bit of toxic damage. Uh, there's some speculation eating certain plants, the polyphenols or flavonoids are actually causing a reaction that's good for us rather than those things, those compounds plugging in seamlessly with our biochemistry. Uh, but in the case of, of, of this, I realized that I used to try to grind like him, but I couldn't do it. I'm not cut out for it. So when I worked in finance, I would do the same things he would do. You know, it's one in the morning and I'm working on a financial model and I can't work anymore, but it doesn't matter because I have to. My superego would come in and say, come on, Chris, you know, do a lap around the office, make more coffee, chug it, you know, do whatever you need to do. Uh, and by the end of my career, go get a beer so that your hands stop shaking. And then you come back and work on your spreadsheets more with a little bit of alcohol in your system so you don't have a seizure or freak out. But I'm, I'm averse to that kind of thing. For me now, I mean, I'm lucky that, that the way I tend to operate now is that I can basically work. I have no problem grinding. But when I reach that stopping point where I just can't focus, I just start my evening routine. You know, I take an Epsom salt bath. I'm lucky to have an infrared sauna. I'll go in the sauna, bring some tea in there. I have like six billion kinds of tea and I'll experiment with them. So I have all of these routines and, you know, I wouldn't call them replacements for alcohol. I, I would call them, uh, and certainly not at this point, you know, seven years addiction free at this point, but I would call them things that I discovered that are actually better than the alcohol for me. So to try to bring this full circle, I think what happens when you have a really strong super ego, which is not a horrible thing, you know, knowing what, you know, having some sense of what is expected of you is not necessarily a bad thing. Having discipline is a good thing. But if you have an id or an inner child that uh, wants to play and you never let it play, it's going to escape out of the cage every now and then. And so I think that's what happens when people uh, when they, they say, oh, I, I relapsed or I had you know a week or I had three weeks and I was doing so well. And that's because they were using their superego, but it was too strong. And their id, their inner child, which just wants to play, was in a cage. And so I think a better long-term solution than keeping the id or the inner child in the cage and keeping the superego on steroids all the time is mm -hmm. to rewire what that inner child wants. And I know we've touched on this topic before. But if you can recalibrate your desires, the desires of your id, in such a way that it actually wants a sauna and tea or quality time with your significant other or to hang out with a friend and drink club soda at a bar rather than go get blitzed or get blitzed in, at your, on your uh, couch or at your dining room table alone, 
if you really want those things and that feeds your id or your inner child, it's not going to want to escape out of the cage and go nuts. Yeah. And it reminds me when it comes to people that are still struggling with alcohol or drugs or behavior addictions, transforming myself back into what that felt like for me, there, there was not much unconscious guilt or shame because that shit was all totally conscious. Lots of guilt and shame. I should be able to drink responsibly or I should be able to not use these hard drugs at least. I should be able to do this. Why can't, why can't I? I'm different. I'm not worthy. I'm unlovable. And th these thoughts weren't like swimming through my head. It was more of like this essence, these feelings. And uh, what he's talking about in this book, Letting Go, Plus, I've also listened to Transcending the Levels of Consciousness and a bunch of YouTube videos and a few podcasts he was on back in the day. But he was saying how people, there's like these vibrational energies to these emotions. The lowest one is shame. It's like zero calibrated, you're dead. 20, shame I think is at 20. Then maybe guilt is right above that at 40. And he talks a lot about um, Alcoholics Anonymous and how that program, and he think he loves it to death, which is like one of the few things I disagree with him because he doesn't realize that there's a biochemical component to drugs and alcohol too. But what he's talking about is how those steps take people from those lower frequency emotions of guilt, shame, fear. Then when you start getting up into like anger, pride, how those 12 steps help people to elevate their consciousness, to transcend shame guilt, pride, anger, uh, then all the way ultimately to love and how those steps get people to be more loving, more un more compassionate, more loving, more full of empathy. And he uses that as kind of a, a roadmap to transcend addiction, is to transcend the levels of consciousness of like, I wouldn't know where I'm at right now. I'd say probably I'm not at love as, as like a place where I live, I experience love a ton, but I'd say I'm probably right below there, more at like reason. I'm above acceptance and willingness. I'm probably around reason, or maybe I'm just full of shit and I don't even know. Maybe I have some blind spots, but I love all that stuff because it's really like, and he calls another one power versus force. He wrote a book on this too, how power is, is much more powerful than force. And when you have like the anger and the pride and all these emotions down here, that's really like forcing things. And then true power, he says, once you get into the love and the acceptance and the willingness, these things have such a transformative energy and they go with the law of attraction and like attracts like. So it's just really cool stuff. And it ha had I learned this a long time ago, man, I'd probably be like an expert in all this stuff. Whereas right now I'm totally butchering uh, so many of the cool things because it's just, I haven't learned it that much, but I'm really obsessed with his model of transcending the levels of consciousness, power versus force, how to let go to win. It's basically letting go of the small S, the small self, ego is super ego, who we really think we are, trading that in, surrendering that, calling the ego out like, we needed the ego to survive to get to where we are now. So thank you, ego, for that. But then how to continuously tame the ego, see where it's coming up to ultimately, you know, live life more as the big S, your big self, your higher self, which doesn't care about any of that shit. It's, right. it's, it's fun stuff. It's difficult. It's very difficult. A lot of the stuff he writes is really, really intellectual. I mean, he's got a PhD and an MD. I think he was doing this stuff for like 60 years. The guy's a full on master. I'll have to check out the book because I'm not sure I understand the numerical values attached with levels of consciousness. Uh, I could see any program that someone earnestly works as helping them to reach a higher state. I think being authentic, being genuine, trying to be yourself, trying to accept yourself while also dissociating from your most base instincts and understanding them and forgiving yourself for them, but moving beyond them would be key to elevating your consciousness. And 
I certainly don't do that perfectly. I don't know if anyone does. You might maybe you have to meditate in a cave in, in Tibet for 10 years to get there. I don't know. Uh, I, I still have phases where I, I don't meditate. And then I, I realize like something's missing. I'm having racing thoughts, not the kind of racing thoughts I used to have like involuntarily where I thought I was going crazy because of alcohol or post acute withdrawal, but you know, just too much rumination. If I, if I realize that I'm, I'm walking into the gym and I don't see what's in front of me because, or I miss saying hi to someone because my to-do list is flashing through my mind, then I need to take time out. And today, actually, after my workout, I was in the steam room and I remembered this quick little meditation type technique uh, that I think I learned from the author of the surrender experiment, whose name always eludes me. Uh, and it's basically you close your eyes, relax your body, and you try to, this sounds weird and woo woo, but if you try it, I think it'll work because I'm not some meditation master and it works for me, but you try to get in touch with like your inner organs. Like, how's my stomach doing? How's my heart doing? How is, you know, what's going on in there? You try to get in touch with your body and then you try to feel your body's energy field. And I notice when I do that, I get these little brief fleeting flashes of euphoria. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if I do have an energy. I assume there's an energy field or, you know, we're, we're all composed of matter and energy, which are the same thing. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it's like I, I get a little buzz from it almost. I did that for probably five minutes and I was able to turn my brain off from my to-do list and the things that float around up there for no reason and just focus on myself and feel this almost like light being energy field. And I don't think I'd ever done that until I had read that book, The Surrender Experiment, where he, where he discusses that. And that's kind of an autobiographical book. Some people like it, some people don't. I found it to be interesting. But the more books like this I read, and I will be reading the one by uh, Dr. Hawkins, I think you said, the, I feel like the more transcendent I become in terms of understanding my past, having an empowering narrative about what's going on in my life, and most importantly, being okay with the present. Yeah. And Michael A. Singer, who wrote The Surrender Experiment and the book before that, his first book, uh, let's see, The Untethered Soul, which you and I got a lot of value That's from. That's a better one to read first, I think. Yeah. Then yeah. Yeah. The untethered soul is a great one. Yeah. Way better to listen or read that or listen to it first. And in the surrender experiment, pretty much everything he talks about that it's the same exact stuff as the letting go book is talking about. It's like, I've been agnostic, agnostic in the past. Um, and I thought my ego was the most powerful force or other people's egos and brains. And what Michael Singer is teaching and Dr. Hawkins was teaching is that there is a all powerful force might, you know, probably not a white old white man in the sky, like a lot of people might think, uh, but there is some type of force that created all this. And that's probably if it can create all of this in the whole universe, probably more powerful than me. So and that's what Michael Singer was talking about, just continuing to surrender to let go, to, to surrender to the flow of life is I think he was calling it. And I'm not even sure how much he mentioned God or the universe in that book. It was really just surrendering to what life appeared to be. That looks scary, man. He took that to a whole gnarly thing, but look at how great his life uh, did. And I, I semi remember uh, reading that part about that meditation. I've never done it, but I want to go try it today because that sounds phenomenal phenomenal uh and it's like you can do it in five minutes right we should do you should do a youtube video for fit recovery on how to do that that'd be a fantastic because yeah, you were talking about a, a like a spiritual euphoria that's the kundalini or the or the spiritual energy rising up that's a really good feeling man that's way better than drugs way better than drinking oh yeah well it's actually a weird feeling it's almost like a tit like a tickled <laughs> and I almost wanted to laugh. Um, I can't really explain it. Maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. It was like a, a euphoria that kind of tickled. And I could. it was like, oof, all right. I'm getting in touch with something I never really felt before. 
And I understand how woo-woo this all sounds, but try it for yourself. Another book that touches on a similar type of meditation is uh, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, I believe. And he talks about something similar. I know Michael Singer relaxes his body. I've long done, I, I, I have a mantra, which I've discussed and I've, I've written about in my course and in my book. That same mantra I still repeat every day, but I also like to experiment with sequential relaxation. I do that before bed. And I used to, in order to go to sleep, because I used to use alcohol to sleep and going back to the age of probably six, I've had a hard time sleeping. Uh, and now I don't really have a hard time sleeping when I go to bed. My biggest struggle is wanting to go to bed. And that's a whole nother thing. And I can, I can hack that. It's just a matter of what, what does, what is my inner child desire? You know, what are the reasons that I want to stay up till one Oh, to get work done so I can feel accomplished? Well, why don't we just wind down and try to do it in the morning? So that's like a negotiation with myself. But as far as actually going to sleep, once my head hits the pillow, I used to in, in early recovery, and I forget where I read about it, but I would relax everything from my head to my toes. And some people go from their toes to their head, but I would always start with my eyelids for some reason. And I would just say to myself, relax your eyes. And I would be astounded by how much tension I actually had in my eyelids. It's like most nights, I guess, when I didn't do that, I was going to sleep like, you know, clenching my eyes and I didn't even know. It's like silly. And then, you know, you get down to the jaw and you're like, sometimes your jaw is clenched for no reason or your neck is all tight. So you, you relax everything. It's amazing how much better you feel. I would have to think that you sleep way better if you've sequentially relaxed your whole body and you're not in knots. And so obviously this, this must have some relation to the whole TMS phenomenon. It's no wonder people are, have chronic pain when they're walking around all tight up, tightened up like that. They're not in touch with their internal, with their internal energy fields, whatever those are. And they just have racing thoughts all the time. The brain, the brain's just sending pain signals to distract them from how overwhelming their moment to moment existence is. Yeah. He, and David Hawkins wrote about this process. I, I'm going to have to order the physical book too of letting go because there was just so many gems in there. And he was explaining the process by which if people are stressed out and their that stress is in their body and they're repressing or suppressing emotions, then that affects the autonomic nervous system, the central nervous system, the endocrine system. And the way he explained it was so fantastic because I have not heard any doctors uh, explain in a really scientific way versus the kind of Freudian way or woo woo way of this type of stuff. He had very scientific uh, explanations for the process of how it screws up our many of our bodily systems when we're repressing emotions, when we have chronic stress, all this stuff. And so the way he just connects everything together, he's like my new. What I do is when I find someone new like this, such as Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, such as Dr. Wayne Dyer, who has passed away. Uh, several years ago now, such as Tony Robbins, such as many other people, and now Sir David Hawkins, is what I do is I go huge on learning so much from them. And then when I find that it's like a lot of repetitive stuff and I know it, then I've, I'm done learning for that person, at least in like this total immersion way. Then it's kind of more spatial. Like I don't listen to that much Jordan B. Peterson stuff that often anymore. Because, you know, I think I know what, how he thinks and I know a lot of his best ideas. And so, but, but at the beginning, when my sister introduced me to 12 Rules for Life, I had never heard about him. And so when I started to read that book, I was like, oh my gosh, I probably watched more than 100 hours of him on YouTube. So it's so cool with the internet, uh, as, for as many negative consequences as the internet has brought to life. I, it, it totally changed my life because now all this info and all these people, these wonderful people and their ideas are all in my phone, in my pocket, 24-7. And back in the day, I didn't know how to get rid of acne or hypoglycemia or alcoholism or drug addiction or depression or low self-esteem or how to get good with girls other than things that you could buy at a physical bookstore. I'm 42 years old now. And, you know, for a lot of that time, I, you know, and I wasn't reading books back then. I'm not going to the bookstore. I wasn't going to the library. Now it's so easy if I want to learn about something. 
everything David Hawkins has ever done, all his videos, books, everything's right there on my phone. And I, and I want people to just not take that for granted and realize how freaking empowering that is that we have that ability. And then it's just a matter of searching for the info and the people and the ideas that resonate with us that we feel is right for now. Most importantly, after that, take action, 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 action. And that's in the past, I was like learning, 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 doing some action. But once I got into massive action, that's when everything started to change. You feel what you focus on and you are what you think. Uh, and I think the first one of those comes from Tony Robbins. But I'm actually about to, at some point tonight after I get some more stuff done, I have erased my whiteboard. It's time for a new whiteboard. And I'm excited about it because that's my opportunity to translate my thoughts, things that have been simmering in my subconscious, things that have been inspired by books that I've read and, and people that I've, whose ideas I've immersed myself in lately. Um, it's time to translate all of that subconscious simmering into something that is going to guide the next few weeks, maybe a few months of my life. And, you know, I, I have a notebook. I probably have thousands of pages of notes because I've I like to write every morning when I wake up. Sometimes I'll have some tea or some coffee. And then, you know, as soon as the brain turns on and I can, you know, I know where I am, depending on how long I slept or how blissfully I slept, I start writing. But for, for some reason, it helps me to have a whiteboard just in the middle of my my office. And that like I, I don't I might not follow it 100 percent but it's directionally accurate in terms of where I'm going to go. And that's such a contrast to the way my life was organized or not organized back when I was a heavy drinker. I would, I would go with the flow of life, but it was chaotic and there was no intention or consciousness whatsoever. It was just like, you know, oh, all right, I'm going to a bar now. We'll see if I make it to work tomorrow. You know, and then, of course, things happen, negative consequences and trade-offs start to rear their heads, and I wasn't prepared to deal with it. But at least now I can go with the flow of life. I forgive myself in advance for not doing everything that I put on that whiteboard. I'm not trying to use it as a tool for self-flagellation so I can point at it and beat myself up for what I didn't do. But it's like I'm gently setting the stage for the things that I'm going to gravitate towards because... We do feel what we focus on and we are what we think. And I think, you know, beliefs and having a being able to visualize what you want is really important. You know, we, people talk about the law of attraction all of the time. It doesn't happen without action. You know, you can sit there and ruminate all the time. You're not necessarily going to translate something into reality if you don't do it. But the first step towards doing it, whatever it is, whether it's quitting drinking, making it past detox, beating post-acute withdrawal, getting in shape. Uh, you know, getting over an autoimmune condition or immersing yourself in books to figure out why the hell you have chronic pain, reading Dr. Sono and all of that, or, or clearing up acne. It doesn't matter. Starting a business on and on and on. Uh, the first step is always figuring out what your blueprint is and coming up with a plan and trying to make it the best informed plan that you have now that you can tweak as time goes on as you gain additional information. And so I, I feel like over time, I've gotten better at that process because of the vast array of resources, many of which I've gotten from you at your suggestion. So I owe you for that. I don't remember how I found Tony Robbins, but uh, Unlimited Power and then Awaken the Giant Within. Unlimited Power was one of the first books that I read after quitting drinking that wasn't a depressing recovery memoir. And I was just blown away. I was so excited after reading that book. Because I thought, you know, I, I had conflicting thoughts at the time about the uh, AA and its potential role for my life. I didn't really know what I wanted to do as far as a career. I was doing personal training and I, I reached stability, but there was no, not a whole lot of euphoria or excitement. It was just like, all right, here I am, now what? And that book helped me launch into something totally different. And then it seemed that every additional book that I read became more profound and offered more things. And so my, my blueprint for living became more informed and yet uh, trying to go along with the flow of life became more and more effortless and fun. Oh, I love that. And, and 
an intuition or an idea popped up when you were talking about that. And I've been stuck in this at times in life, but not currently, and it's not really an issue for me nowadays, typically. But back then, when you were learning about Tony Robbins, and then probably a couple of years before that, I was over here on the other coast learning about him in my own way. And that book, Unlimited Power, was so powerful. And one of the first personal development books I ever read that it shifted everything in me. It was like if one uh, self-help book can pr really program the shit out of you and rewrite new software to your mind, that was the book that did it for me. And it sounds like you too. But then now with all the different social medias and even with YouTube, how before people, before these came out, people could go, okay, this is what I want to learn about. And they'd have to go look for it. Now people can easily get into the habit of, uh, you know, just by habit, pulling out their phone and just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling for hours and hours, and then just watching what looks good that YouTube is recommending. And then, of course, eventually it gets to the point where YouTube knows a lot of the stuff you like. So hopefully you're learning a bunch of the stuff or being entertained by the stuff you want. But uh, so many people are on there. I forget the stats on it but are on hours and hours and hours a day scrolling Facebook or scrolling YouTube or whatever with no intention of what they want to learn or how they want to be entertained or what their specific like outcome that they want for it is. And it's more of like a, a pacifier thing. Like when a baby's like, eh, pacifier, you know, constant action, need constant stimulate stimulation. So if someone's bored for a second or tired, Oh, let me pull this out instant dopamine, instant novelty. And, you know, that can be good a little bit here and there in moderation. But what's happening now is it's over overruling people's lives and it's giving them less and less agency over what they want to focus on and what they want to do. And I was trapped in that for a while, not a whole long time, because uh, I was because I have such high aware awareness nowadays. I was like, wait, what the heck am I doing? And then move on from that. So but without the consciousness, without the awareness, people that their consciousness is at guilt all the time or at anger all the time as a place where they live. So they can experience all these different emotions. But if their kind of baseline is a low area of con consciousness, then these types of books that you and I are into and these types of ideas, it, it might not even be accessible to them unless someone comes and grabs them and leads them through. So it's just so trippy how that's why some people will be like when it comes to the news and politics, you know, a lot of people, they're down at anger and this and that. They can't laugh at stuff. They can't laugh at all the crazy shit going on. They can't feel compassion for all these things that are going on. They're stuck mm -hmm. at anger and indignation and other negative feelings that gives us a secondary payoff. The, the ego juice, and I noticed this as soon as I heard about it from Dr. Hawkins. There's a secondary ego juice that we get. That person's wrong, this, that, and the other. And I've like noticed, I'm like, I got to start doing that less because I want to start to slowly get away from that. I know it's not an overnight process, but how I'd be watching the news or watching something else. And I'm like, oh, making somebody else wrong. So you're the, you're the good a person and that person is the perpetrator and you're the victim. And I was like, I don't want to do that, even if it is for a secondary payoff of this ego juice. And so I tried to cut it out completely and I couldn't. It was like a cold turkey detox. So now I'm slowly giving myself time to like move slowly to that because man, that payoff, I do know what he's talking about and it, and it does give you a little payoff. Uh, so that's going to be probably a difficult one to break for me. Yeah. Well, I, I love all that. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I've definitely had moments where I'm scrolling myself on YouTube. Sometimes I'll just go to my own YouTube channel to see what's what's going on. Uh, or maybe I'll be watching a podcast you did with a guest. And then all these things pop up. Next thing I know, I've spent 25 minutes watching, you know, pit bull chases after deer videos. And I have two amazing little pit bull mixes. And I'm, why am I, you know, watching this video? I have two here that are real, that are in <laughs> HD reality. 
And so I, what I'll do is when I realize I'm doing that, I just turn, I click the thing on my phone, turn off and slam the phone down and then go do something in, in real life. I, I think I, I have an aversion to whatever this uh, potential virtual world that, that the tech titans are likely ushering in. Uh, I have an instinctual aversion to that. Also kind of an instinctual aversion to groupthink, but but there I am getting pulled in by the algorithm, which knows exactly what I want, which can be good if I'm having a bad day and it, and it suggests a Tony Robbins clip that's five minutes long and, you know, give me a little pep talk. Uh, and, and by the way, I don't have that many bad days, but, you know, maybe something happens and I didn't get something done, then it can be good to have a little lift. But there are and there are worse things to watch than pit bulls chasing deer. It's pretty entertaining. But compared to the trade offs, the opportunity cost of that is hanging out with my my real dogs. Uh, and, and other people, you know, have kids and, and all that. You don't want to be sucked into some cyber uh, hole, but we all do it. It seems to just be a pitfall of modern life. And it's best not to beat ourselves up if we do. You just try to take action and try to live as consciously as you can. And over time, I think you progressively live more consciously. And I'll say that without a full understanding of Dr. Hawkins system for exactly how the consciousness levels are raised. But that seems right. Uh, to me. So at any rate, I know we're going to keep today succinct. We have some awesome episodes coming up, but I'm really glad that you and I were able to hang out again today. Yeah, this was really fun. Said it a million times, doesn't feel like work. And I missed my friend too, not just, you know, creating content with you, but we hadn't seen each other. So it's like good to check in and the friendship thing too makes me feel better. So thanks for that as well. Boom.